Either we are there or not, ITSB Magazine still gets the best stories. There are plenty of conferences and all sorts of events that spark our curiosity and allow us to start conversations with some of the world's brightest minds. In person or virtually, we sit down with them at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Together, we discover what the synergy of these three elements means for the future of humanity. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is Marco Ciappelli. We are going to talk again about CES coming up uh, January 2024, where apparently we can foresee the future. I heard this from a few <laughs> a few people. Uh, it's not the DeLorean time machine. It's not the, the Doctor Who police uh, <laughs> station. Uh, but it's something that it certainly has changed throughout the years. It's not about the radio anymore like it was at the beginning it's not about the gadgets only or the new tv or the walkman or the new phone it is about really society uh, as there is a track for absolutely everything uh, just yesterday i talked with the director of uh, thematics experience at uh, ces and he told me how the the magic happened how they decide i feel the pulse of society and where the market is going so um, very excited for ITSP Magazine to cover this. It's definitely part of a Redefining Society podcast where we talk about technology and society. Talking about that, today we actually talk uh, a little bit of, of the entertainment industry. And uh, we're going to do that with Leslie Shannon, which is the head of trend and innovation scouting at Nokia. That uh, She has a panel with IBM and NVIDIA. So something interesting the panel is called 2024 the ai inflection point i said ai so we need to drink uh that's the that's the buzz <laughs> oh are those the rules <laughs> <laughs> i don't know it's just i, uh -oh. I can't have i cannot have a podcast without talking about ai anymore who it's can, impossible who can. <laughs> anyway entertainment internet and media um enough <laughs> about me talking you already heard leslie uh, laughing that's a good start leslie welcome to the show Thank you so much, Marco. Well, so let, let's start with uh, who you are, your passion. I know you also, on top of working on this uh, trend and innovation with Nokia, you also wrote books about Generation Z and the way they consume entertainment. And so I'm very passionate about that kind of stuff, too. And uh, and how you how excited are you about this panel? Yep. I I am so so thrilled about this. This is actually part of the Digital Hollywood um, uh, event, which takes place the day before the official CES kicks off. So it's Monday on January eighth at the Aria, and and it's a it's kind of a little mini microcosm of all kinds of people who are involved in the the media and where it's going from a technological point of view, and it's always so mind-expanding. Um, I come from the technology industry. I usually hang out with technology people. I'm more likely to be with an IT person than a movie producer, but this is an opportunity where I get to hang out with <laughs> movie producers and 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 learn a lot. Um, you mentioned the the panelists. We've got uh, uh, Steve Kenepa from, um, Kenepa, sorry, from IBM. Uh, he's the... Uh, He's, these, these are both like really big cheeses, and so I'm really excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> Steve has been working on AI with, uh, with uh, uh, IBM for a long, long time. Um, and Richard Ferris is uh, the head of media and entertainment for NVIDIA. Um, and he's also been in the movie industry for a long time. But Steve and I had a particularly good connection because... Um, he was part of the team that worked on Watson the, uh, back in the original days when it was trying to you know, win on Jeopardy. And that was a huge development process. And <clears throat> the thing is that I actually uh, was an undefeated uh, champion on Jeopardy back in the 90s. And wow. Yeah. And so a lot of my friends who were in the New York area, because that's where a lot of the work was done, who were Jeopardy champions, because you all get to know each other at a certain point, <laughs> um, they uh, they were invited up to um, IBM's office in White Plains to actually be to do testing against Watson. So I had heard about the development of Watson from the Jeopardy player angle, um, but I had not heard about it so much from the IBM angle. And so, so it's been just wonderful to like have conversations with Steve and kind of learn about the challenges that they were trying to solve and, and, and 
you know how they how they managed to do it so wow that's funny i, li- I yeah. like that a little a little nugget of curiosity uh <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right, right and we're not going to be talking about Watson or Jeopardy at this no, panel. Okay. I just want to be clear of it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm flexible. I don't have, <laughs> I don't have plans. Uh, so, let, so obviously, uh, I live in LA. So somehow I'm connected to to the industry, and uh, everybody heard the fact that for the past six months we just got back into normal. Uh, with the strike, with all the worries about AI in the industry, the, all the streaming model, I think stuff that people never even thought about. Uh, and by people, I mean the people that go to watch the movies, right? Or, or flip around Netflix and, and all the streaming media. We don't know what the model is there. But if there is one thing I think everybody's understanding is the fact that AI is part of that. I mean, the cat is out of the bag. We know that. I knew that it was already in, out of the bag a long time ago, but now everybody knows. <laughs> so <laughs> AI has been working in the back end, maybe for more logistic things. But now we're talking about coming really in the spotlight and the way they do things. So um, th- there is one thing in the description, very short description of what to expect from the panel is the fact that you you guys compare the the advent of the internet and now the generative AI. One took uh, 20 yeah. years to get to 100 millions, and this one in a few months, one year was one year anniversary just a few days ago for uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT to go public. And we're talking about billions of people. So yeah. uh, how's that going? <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, part of the reason it took the internet, you know, 20 years to reach uh, a significant number of users was that the infrastructure was not in place. And so a big part of that time in the development of the the internet was literally the laying of the fiber and, you know, getting us beyond modems and so on and so forth. And so that was a huge infrastructure push that, you know, companies like Nokia are, are involved in. And, and while that work is still far from finished, um, when ChatGPT came out, when OpenAI came out, um, it's everybody, as soon as you hear about it, you can access it instantly because mm-hmm. the infrastructure is already there. So that's a, that's a right. huge part of it. Um, but but you're, you're not wrong to actually point out this, this um, uh, disparity because here's the thing, at the beginning of the internet, even if, let, let's, you know, little parallel universe here, um, you hear about the internet uh, one day in 1991, and it's, and it's already there. Let's just imagine it's already there. Would you go use it? Eh, probably not, because you wouldn't know what it's for. <clears throat> the difference with uh, generative AI is that not only is the infrastructure there for people to actually try it, people are actually trying it. And that's a really significant thing. They're, they already have an idea, or maybe they don't have an idea, but they're curious about the possibilities, so they're willing to go out there and check it out for themselves. And, and you know, and that's part of the, it's, it's got this amazing appeal, and people are, yeah, experimenting with it from the start. But I think one of the distinctions that we're going to make in the, the panel is there is a very serious distinction between consumer AI and machine learning, so generative AI uh, in all of its things, and and the stuff that's actually being used by enterprise, including the large Hollywood studios. Because this CGI has been around forever. Well, okay, not forever. <laughs> but it's long, long enough. Long enough, right? It's established. You make movies with it. It's no longer a huge shocking surprise to see a movie that has a lot of CGI in it. Um, but it's the shift from having it be something super expensive behind closed doors at movie studios and now being democratized and being mm-hmm. able to be accessed by everybody. And everybody is interested in that. So suddenly we've got people who are generating things that that may have had an idea before, but have no idea how to bring it to fruition. Now we're starting to put the tools in their hands. I love what you said, because it's kind of like a magic moment where to be at the right time, at the right place with the right technology and how things happen all of a sudden, it's kind of like the overnight success. It's not really an overnight success. (laughs) People work really hard (laughs) to get there, right? So I I feel like it's the same thing when you talk about the infrastructure that it's right there, so it's more accessible and the technology comes together to be able to offer something and the internet 
I mean, I remember those days that uh, you almost needed an engineer degree to set up a, a dial-up modem, and then <laughs> you're not you know, wrong. I did. I, I don't even want to remember that. I, even if the noise is in my head right now, I'm hearing it too. <laughs> <laughs> but but so now I love that that you're like, oh, I heard about this. Let me get my smartphone. Ba ba ba, and you're, yeah, you're on it. That's, <laughs> And, and, and this is not just a function of, yeah, the infrastructure is there. You know, as, as Nokia's head of um, uh, trend and innovation scouting, my job is to look at new technologies as they come out. So I look at, and I've been doing this for the last eight years, so I've been, I look at a lot of things. And, and just two examples, for example, um, when uh, I'm, I'm very heavily into AR, VR, metaverse kinds of things, and that's one of the books that I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really firmly believe in the power of consumer augmented reality through headsets that we're going to be mm -hmm. seeing at the end of this decade. And there's a lot of you know work behind the scenes now getting that infrastructure layer down. So this is going to be really exciting. But but when I but even if I'm talking about virtual reality, which is out there and the uh, headsets are affordable, if I'm talking to a bunch of of um, executives at, at one of our customers, because that's, that's what I've spent a lot of my time doing. Um, most of them will never have had a VR experience. They will not have put on a headset and done anything. Blockchain. I can be talking about blockchain, but it's really likely that the executives that I'm talking to have never minted an NFT mm. or they had a crypto wallet. They have, they're like, yeah, 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 I've heard the words, you know, not, 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 but they haven't actually done it. <laughs> With generative AI, completely different. I go in and I'm like, uh, yeah, and prompt crafting. And then suddenly everybody in the room is like, yeah, well, I tried this and I tried that and I find this works. Mm. It, totally different. This is, this is a very, very hands-on. The democratization of this is, is the power. And, and so it's, we have just raised the, the minimum level for all kinds of things, for production of all kinds of media and other things to a really high level. And now anybody can get themselves and their ideas up to this really quite high level using these tools. Yep, all makes sense. And I, I definitely want to invite you back and talk about your book and about all of this. And uh, and I wonder if you need help. Uh, I love to look at technology too. So that's, that's a good job. I mean, I, I I'm do the same to get in thing line. in a way. <laughs> no, I know. It's like oh, I get paid to do this. I mean, it's it's. I I I, lo I love to invite people that that have hands on on things and see what's what's going on and kind of foresee in the future. But uh, the, the future is here. So the, that's, that's the point. It's accessible. Um, I got my mom on, on ChatGPT. And so wow. she's asking things to, to ChatGPT. And it's amazing. She's 74, whatever she is. Oh, so it's honor. incredible. That's right? great. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but, so, but, but that's one generation. Then there is some other generation in between, somebody jumped on the train somebody was a little resistant as it's society it's always like this with technology there's the early adopter and not but now we have a generation that it's native i mean yes they're born with a smartphone in their hand yes. and it's kind of like they don't know how to use a rotary phone and that's kind of weird but okay <laughs> but i understand it. i don't know how to use a gramophone um, you know well, maybe i'll figure it out but the point is, so where are we standing now? I mean, what, what is the big shift, this inflection point that, that you're, you're mentioning here in, in, in the entertainment industry, or if you want to widen the topic, feel free to do that too. Yeah, I think, um, well, I mean, I'll, <clears throat> I'll leave it to Steve and Richard to, to talk about you know, when we're actually on the panel, you know, right, how they see yeah, it. Don't they're give actually, out too much. Yeah, yeah, they're the <laughs> Plus computer you don't experts. Know. <laughs> right. And I'm, I'm, I'm more of the uh, kind of uh, social uh, and technology right. observer. Yeah. And so, um, so some of the things that, that I see, the, for me, the, the, the generative AI moment is, is very similar to when I was in high school, um, many moons ago, uh, that was actually when pocket calculators first became affordable. And, and there was a huge debate in my chemistry class, my physics class, and my mm -hmm. calculus class about whether pocket calculators could be allowed. Mm -hmm. And then of those, uh, my chemistry teacher and my physics teacher allowed 
pocket calculators. My chemistry teacher actually required it. My calculus teacher outlawed it. And across town, my friends in the other high school, their physics teacher wouldn't let them use the pocket calculator. And this is, and we're talking like the equivalent of a calculator on our phone, right? I mean, it just adds, subtracts, and divides. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, my kids are in high school and a TI-84 is required for everybody who's in any of those things. So what happens is at the beginning, the tools come in and they're regarded as being suspect because if you're letting these kids use these tools, they're not going to learn the underlying principles and humanity is going to like, you know, just, it's the end of humanity. Well, what we found was that if in the pocket calculator example, the, the kids who learned how to use the pocket calculator <laughs> were the ones who were in the end better positioned because out in the real life, guess what? You use the tools. You use the things that you can do to take away the grunt work mm -hmm. and to actually get yourself to an end product in the most efficient and best quality way possible. And if it's a tool that helps you do that, then absolutely. So part my so I personally believe that education should be about training our populace to use the tools that are available. So from that point of view and for and so now we have these tools and we have the particularly weird moment of COVID. And the reason that I bring that up <clears throat> is that when everybody had to go home and be doing their schooling from home, a huge amount of work, schoolwork that might have been done in person or in some other format got moved into digital media even more than it had been before. And one of the best examples that I can give of this is uh, my, my children's gym class. My uh, uh, younger son was eighth grade when uh, COVID hit. And, um, and so the way that they did the gym class was he had, they, they gave him a set of exercises that they had to do, and they had to film themselves on their phones doing those exercises, but then speed up the video so that the video itself only ran for like 20 seconds, and then send that to the gym teacher. So yes, it's a gym class, but it's also a video production class. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so, so now we've got this whole generation and this is internationally, this whole generation of kids for whom video production is, it's just part of work. And in fact, there's a really interesting, um, uh, there's a, there's a, um, uh, a market research company called NIT, K-N-I-T, that focuses on Gen Z. And what they do is they have, they send out the questionnaires, but they're not like online so much as like you have to type in your answers or anything like that they uh, they here's the questions and then they ask the respondents to film a video of themselves answering the questions because that's the most natural way that gen z communicates with, with each other and then it uses ai to unpack that and then to find find the answers and stuff and turn it back into text for like oldies like us who prefer read things in text and what this means though is that we actually have now you know an entire generation for whom video is the first language Mm. And and when we and, and production and creation of that and understanding, I mean, when I go to the movies with my kids, uh, I went and I saw Maestro with my 18 year old. He came away and he was talking about the cinematography and the framing of the shots and, and the choices um, of hiding faces and some of the. When I was 18, I ne never would have thought of that because he's been doing video production since he was 13. He understands all this. So mm -hmm. we're going to have, so this democratization moment of, so COVID created this, this world of young people who are into video production. And of course, TikTok has really helped with that too, for rewarding people who do good stuff. And now generative AI is making it even easier to make magical, wonderful things. What this means long-term for the entertainment industry is really, you know, a, a huge question because that, that, you know, now everybody can be their own Pixar, you know, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Don't, don't tell Disney, but okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the challenges for the original social media companies was that they were not originally structured to help, um, uh, mm end users monetize and 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 so the kind of the slow shift to realizing like oh we're just you know we're just letting people show videos or whatever and then shifting to oh these normal people could actually be earning money from this and we as a platform could be helping them that would actually took a long time and some platforms were better at that than others the and 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 
you know, so the Hollywood companies that realize, you know what, there's this whole world out there of the democratized stuff that maybe we should be aware of, maybe we should be including, or, or, not, or I don't know, I don't know, but it's, it's, I think the, we're, we're, we are at some kind of a tipping point um, that I think will actually really start to become visible quite strongly in 2024. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had this conversation in regard to, to social media and, and sociology of communication in general, like I, when I used to study media, and that's back in the days, um, I'm dating myself too, uh, also you can look at my beard. But <laughs> I mean, there they were still like the, the 15 minutes of fame, and the world, maybe you'll get on TV. The media was one direction. We, the user were on one side, they were not interacting with it. And then with the social media, we started interacting with the medium and the company had to get feedback, brands has changed the way they interacted. And now you're right, you we're at the point where even the, the entertainment could become somehow interactive, where you participate more in that because you, you have the knowledge and you have the tools to do it. So it's very, very interesting conversation, this one um, to have for sure. Yeah, so so it's not just going to be, um, you know, somebody creating a video clearly in their bedroom, you know, and like it's 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 fun and it's lovely and it's it's greatly spirited, but it's still quite amateur. Um, you know, we're going to be getting some extremely high quality. We already are, you know, very high quality productions out there um, from people who are not part of the industry, mm -hmm. and you know, so I don't. I don't know what it means, frankly, when suddenly a kind of an equivalent would be, you know, if, if automobiles could suddenly be made by everybody, <laughs> you know, what, what does that do to Detroit? Uh, if everybody can now build a car in their backyard and it, and it works really well, yeah. um, you know. And in a way, podcasting is the same thing. It's, it's just the audio version, although now oh, it's yeah. also video of, of that. It's like everybody can get it. it a chance at it. Some people are good, some people are not. You get the tool. I mean, you talk about the tool. You, you got cameras on your phone now that you couldn't have on a on a big fat camera that professional twenty years ago. Uh, the, the 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 detail, the the zooming, the panning, and the cinematic of it. It's incredible. Um, so we're getting towards the end of this, although it's tough because I love to talk about this thing. So again, I'm going to have you back. Tell me uh, a little bit more about be being the head of trend and innovation, right? So is it more tech or is it more society? Mm, or is it's really mix? both. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's both. Cause, what um, is more though? Give me a 51. Uh, well, okay, from, from a... Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so so let me explain a little bit about Nokia because you know most people yeah. have heard of Nokia because we used to make mobile phones, but we haven't made mobile I phones had, for ten I years, had those. right? <laughs> I, know. I know they were really good phones, mm -hmm. but we sold that business to Microsoft in, in 2013, and and there are still Nokia phones out there, but they're not made by us; they're made by another company who are licensing our name. All so right. so yeah. So what we do now is, and we did back then too. I've been with the company for 23 years, and I've been mm -hmm. on the network side the whole time. We we actually create the hardware and the software that runs telecommunications networks. Mm -hmm. And we sell that to the phone companies of the world and large enterprises that need to have their own networks. So, so for me, my, um, my role as a, a trend and innovation scout, it is actually deeply informed by the fact that I worked at Nokia Networks. I was actually in headquarters in Finland when the handset business blew up, and, you know, and withered away in like, you know, a really short time. It was like four years. And, um, uh, and part of the reason that, that it happened was that they were not looking outside themselves. They got to a certain point and they're like, we are so fabulous. We don't need to listen to anybody else. We're just mm -hmm. going to do what we want and that's going to make the market. And, and that didn't really work out for them very well. And part of the reason that they didn't take Apple seriously was that Apple did not come from the telco world. They came from the, tele from the computing world. They were a computer maker. And so, well, they don't know anything about phones. And their first phone, the first iPhone, terrible telephone. Terrible telephone, bad antenna, you know, all kinds of, you know, it was from a telco point of view, you know, Nokia's saying this is no threat to us. Well, if, and so that's if you look at the technology part only, 
you will look at the iPhone and you'll go, mm-hmm. oh, that's no threat. But if you look at the social side too, you're like, yeah. oh, you know what? At Nokia, we never really cracked doing email easily on your phones. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd have to know your like, um, I don't know, your IP address and all kinds of pop server and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And and so it's like, oh, they, look, they've got email on there really easily. And look, oh, this app thing now, that's much better than what we've got. And now you're like, well, this might be a threat. Mm. So you, you have to look at it together. You have to look at it not only what is the technology that's creating here, what problem, person, what human problem is it solving? Mm-hmm. And what's the cost of that solution? Because if the cost is too high, it's not going to take off. But if it's if it's solving a problem well enough, and the cost can be in time or fiddliness or whatever, if it's solving the problem well, better than before, and it's at a lower cost than whatever the previous solution was, now you're on to something. And mm-hmm. so, so that's the kind of stuff that I look for, and specifically things involving connectivity, because those are the things that we need to be building the networks for, and we need to be able to see that stuff coming a long way out to make sure that we build the networks in time. Yeah. Yeah, it makes total sense. And there is plenty of, of example in technology for consumers that not necessarily the best technology was the one that was adopted largely. Uh, beta and VHS comes to mind. And, and it, sometimes it's you need to look at what is how it's going to use is how it's going to be used too right 100% and you know in that specific example you know we, that, that was a, that's a, it's one that's used a lot but there's a reason it's used a lot it's because sony was so focused on quality for the beta tapes that they had their videotapes the maximum length of 1 hour yep. and what they missed was that what people wanted to do with videotaping was to tape movies off of the tv and a one hour tape is not long enough and so vhs with the lower quality they had a two hour long tape and that's what people did because that solved the problem exactly so that's that's uh you really need to understand both you need to understand the technology what is possible and you need to understand people what they really want to do with it (laughs) exactly exactly well listen leslie i don't want to take any more of your time uh but I will want to have you back and talk more about this thing because, as you can tell, I would get really, really into it. But let's do a little recap. I'm going to do it for you. So there is uh, uh, the panel is going to be during CES 2024 in Las Vegas, which will take place uh, the 9th to the 12th. But your panel actually is going to be Monday, January the 8th, 9 to 940 and it's called 2024 the ai inflection point entertainment internet and media at the area level one joshua nine you don't have to remember this we're going to put the link to the cs <laughs> website and everybody can check it out um uh it it's been a pleasure i had a lot of fun great conversation leslie thank you for coming and stopping by and good luck with uh with cs and your uh, your panel Marco, thank you so much. This has really been a pleasure. And I mean, so yeah, we're Monday, 9 a.m. We're kicking the whole thing off, you know, but don't don't come see me. Come to see Steve and Richard because these guys, these guys know it all. <laughs> if you want to know the future, there is CES, these are the guys who are going to be able to tell us. the yeah. panel that is going to tell you the future. All right. Cool. And for people that are interested in this conversation, just subscribe to my channel, connect with me on social media or with Leslie, and uh, I'm sure you can get in touch with her. Yep. And uh, that's it. Stay tuned. And uh, I don't know, stay human. I don't know. Lately, I, I say this. A <laughs> that's a bit. great sign off. A, a little bit. A little uh, bit. Stay human and prosper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this episode of our On Location Conversation. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSBmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.